in reality borrows a lot from African religion, acknowledges a lot from African religion, and claims, you know, uh, that uh, they are coming up with something new. But majority of the things that I, you find in Christianity are actually borrowed from African religion. Yeah. So, can I proceed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We were at a time where I was saying, if you look at the first um, four books of the New Testament, which report about the life of Jesus Christ, what we have there are reports by other individuals. You don't hear Jesus speaking. But you have people who claim to be witnesses, and some of them who say they have walked with Jesus, they lived with Jesus, saying he was like this, he was like this. Hence the contradiction was they are giving their portray, portrayal of Jesus from their own personal perspectives. Hence the differences. At one point you hear someone says he paid 5,000. The other one says no, it wasn't 5,000. He paid this number. Uh, same occasion. Yeah, so it's the gospel of Jesus according to Matthew. The gospel of Jesus according to John. The gospel of Jesus according to Mark. The gospel of Jesus according to... So it's always according to. And we as Africans do not have a place where we are reporting about this. We are simply getting this. So, because these are reports about Jesus, what you don't have there is the direct quotations, direct citations. Like right now I'm talking to you. If anyone looks at me, if anyone listen to me, you can see me, you can hear me, you can, you can then say, he was saying this. But if someone is not watching me and they are reporting to you what you are hearing is second-hand information. In other words, I'm saying we do not have first-hand information from Jesus. That's the first, four, the first four books. Right. The other books, eight of them, were penned by one individual. And they were penned by a man called Paul. And while the other four have been spending a lot of time talking about mainly uh, the, the life of Jesus, Paul is the only one who begins to give the rules, the principles of faith uh, that should characterize Christianity. Now, the question that you ask now is, when you look at the Pauline letters, it's clearly directed. This is to the Romans. Letter to the Romans. Letter to the Galatians. Letter to Corinthians. Most of these are islands dotted around, around you know, Greece. Right. Clear places where Paul has been to. And he's uh, actually saying, last time I talked to you about this, you asked me about this, now the explanation is this. That means his audience is clearly defined, well targeted. You don't find a single letter that says, uh, a letter of Paul to Mureo. You don't find that in the Bible. There is no letter of Paul uh, to Mondor. Letter of Paul to the Vatswana, nothing like that. Now, like we said earlier on, these books were collected together by the early elders of the church and, 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 and put together in a conscious way so as to create a certain impression. And even with that, you notice that when you look at the Bible as it exists today, it has gone through several permutations. When the Greeks were ruling, you have the Greek Bible. When they were overtaken by the Romans, the Romans changed the Bible to suit the new Roman rule. So you have the Roman uh, you know, a translation. And then when the British, for instance, took over the English, they also changed uh, you know, the Bible. And that's why you have a King James Version. So it's clear these are versions, but these are versions that are now being used in order to indoctrinate, like any geology, people, and it's now easy for, for, for them to indoctrinate Africans because when people are displaced and they have lost their identity, they can believe anything because there is a, they have nothing to fall back on. This is the crisis that is affecting Africa. When you look at the fate of Christianity in other parts of the world, you will understand. When the missionaries went to Japan, at the same time that they came to Africa, 
the missionaries found the, the situation there tough. Why? Because the, the Japanese had a strong Japanese uh, culture that, uh, the, that, that resisted the new Christianity. And for that reason, all the missionaries, including the few converts that they had succeeded in getting in Japan, were murdered and killed. And so we don't have Christianity in Japan. Now, earlier I did tell you that a good religion, how do we measure that this religion is good? A good religion is measured by the material success that it is giving to the worshippers as well as the spiritual success it is giving to, to the worshippers. But you don't find this happening in Africa. In Africa, people have got illusions of spiritual success and no material success whatsoever. Now, how is it possible that the countries which do not valorize Christianity, and earlier on you were saying there's only one gate, one visa to heaven, how is it that countries that have rejected that one entry visa are the ones that are rich? Look at China. Chinese are not Christians. They are Taoists. They are Buddhists. But they are almost number one economy in the world. The Indians... You really find Christians in the, amongst the Indians. But they see where they are. The best country where you get the best medicine in the world is India. Look at Japan. Look at Germany. These countries do not have Christianity as a core. Including the Asian Tigers. Look at uh, South Korea. Look at uh, you know, uh, the other countries. They, are, they do not valorize Christianity, but they're better off. So, if my assumption is anything to go by, that we measure the success of a religion by the material success it gives to the worshippers as well as the spiritual success, then the only thing that you will find from Christianity actually is the opposite of material success. It's also the opposite of spiritual success because wars and disharmonies, cacophonies, are nowhere better noted than in Africa because of religious differences. Why are we not doing away with religion then? Now, uh, to say, which religion can save us? And I advocate, without any doubt, that people need to go back to their roots. To use the phrase of Achebe, let us identify where the rain began to beat us. The moment you discover that we, the rain began to beat us at this point, then you can recover your path. What do we mean? Earlier on, you were asking me about the month of November. And I can say to you that the month of November can metonymically represent or give you a better eye view of African culture, African religion, African philosophy, African centered metaphysics, how Africans have always related with their creator. You find that in that month which is the month of November, known as Mwezwambuzi in Shona cosmology. Now, many people do not understand why that month is, is sacred. Throughout the world, people follow different calendars. There is the solar calendar. There is the lunar uh, you know, calendar. Africans have always followed the lunar calendar, which is made up of 13 moons. The way the month is a, 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 um, a bastardization, if you want, of moons, 13 moons, 13 months. Now, divided roughly equally of plus or minus 30 days. The one which we are following right now is called the Gregorian calendar. Now, according to the African calendar, which I have described as lunar, with the 13 moons, Mwezwambuzi is actually the last month. It's the month number 13. And it does not begin in the November, as you know, it is now is November 1, it's November 30. It begins somewhere around what you call October, plus or minus mid-October, stretching into plus or minus November. It's the last month. Now, why is it, is, why is it being given this spiritual significance amongst Africans. You need to understand the spiritual hierarchy before we talk about the value of this month. 
Africans have always identified Mwari, Musikavani, Umkulunkulu as the creator, the originator of all things. Now, they believe that he occupies the highest office. When they say he or she, it's because the English language is so highly gendered. In Shona, we would say, if we say Yiva, Mariva, we are not saying he or she. Now, Maripa wa no gara, ndiru wa soro soro kukupetisiru. And kum soro soro does not necessarily mean into the empty sky. But wherever he resides, and he is in everything. Now, pakadipa mwari, panma various spiritual bodies. And Kumashona, we say you have the Mondoro or territorial spirits for the benefit of everybody. We have what territorial spirits? We have Mashikiro, we have Magombe. These are larger than the family spirits. And they are also named after the various specializations and responsibilities. For example, we associate Mangombe with the rain. Right. So, these are below the Creator. But these are the ones who minister for us to the Creator. But between them and us, the living, we also have family spirits, commonly known as Vadzimu. So every individual belongs to a family. Now, within that family, you share one ancestor. Already, don't mean to say you share, it means your identity is defined in terms of others and belonging to one as a family. If we take the first man, which is Indira, in Shona, named after Janus, a multi-headed creature, of their own mythology and creation. It's not in Tira Kuno Kokutanga, and so, right? That Zimwar Kita Bas throughout Kuska Mazuku Pesira Watat Mbuzi. Jadana so Pasanagra was in the Babans, which is why Mbuzi? The God, you we all know Mbuzi to mean God. Now, of all animals in the, within the family, if you talk about Makai, if you talk about Mombe, and so on, Pamusha, the one which receives the least reverence or which is most trivialized is the God. And that's why you say if you don't have, uh, you know, um, dignified words, people tell you, in other words, Mbuzi translates to trivial. Right. What do we mean? Mwezi yokutanga yes iri 12, mwezi miri kusevenza, iri kita basa. It does not include interacting or uh, ministering between the living and the, 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 the dead, across the hierarchy of spirits up to God. But they need the time to rest when they can concentrate on spiritual matters between the spirits and the various hierarchies of the spirits away from from men. This is the time when Mawadzimu, some people interpret this to say, but this is not the kind of rest that they have, are tired. No, but if you understand African cosmology, every spirit requires a regeneration of strength in order to wake again. It's like a service. No. You have a car, when it has gone on and on and on the next thing, after certain mileage, you take it for service. It's now rejuvenated. So the month that has been chosen is the very last month. After all this hard work, the spirits need time to rest so that they can rejuv rejuvenate. They can be re-energized to start all over again in Jira, protecting the living. So some interpret this to mean this is the time when the ancestors uh, resolve certain issues 
through the various hierarchies of the spirits with the, out, uh, uh, and with the ultimate, which is the creator, before they come back to men. So during this particular period, the only way to respect our ancestors, um, it only makes sense, because if you try to, try to, uh, to, 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 to approach the ancestors during this particular time, they are busy with something else. They are not likely to be had. It's also a sign of respect to say, you need enough time to deliberate on your own. You, great spirits, and we. The best way to, to respect you is to make sure that we, we, you don't marry during this particular period, but there's nobody to bless the marriage. You don't, you, um, um, it's even not properly advised even to give birth during this particular period. Why? Because there is nobody to bless that. So we abstain from a number of things by way of respect of our ancestors and by way of giving them enough time to go out there uh, to minister with the other bigger spirits across the hierarchies and to get more power. And Christianity has borrowed a lot from this. I'll tell you why. Earlier you were also asking about, about uh, holy places. It's not every place that is holy, but there are certain places that have been identified as holy or as shrines. So, like mountains, I'll give you an example. Mountains have got a symbolic significance in African cosmology. Uh, that's where, uh, even according to the Christian Jesus, he would go up, uh, up a mountain. When he wanted to get reinvigorated, he would fast and then spend time in the what? In the, in the mountain. So, these are gateways or places where spirits they gather and they get uh, rejuvenated, after which they can come down. So it's the same thing here. Because we associate it, even, uh, uh, even if we use the, uh, the, the Christian Bible, as we know, is what say, Raka Zorora. In other words, God rested on the seventh day. So you want to equate the significance of the seventh day to Mezwambuzi. Not with the Masalata. Ah, not with Masalata. Masalata can ask about Remember what I said earlier. Masalata and Dewapi, I'm not my job as witness, do you? So, okay. But I don't know which part the seventh day. Kuti, yeah. Um, normally, I want to, to confine myself uh, within the reign of scholarship. So I don't want to challenge them and say you are lost. I don't want to say uh, that uh, uh, they, they, they are perfect. But like I said, they are part of the many tender calls. I'm being very polite. Part of the many tender calls of philosophical displacement. And what we have reaped from uh, the, uh, this and the many other such denominations is a division amongst Africans. Africans have been divided. Africans have been divided. Africans have been dislocated. Africans have been uprooted. Africans have been separated from each other. They are no longer organically linked as brothers they are no longer organically linked as brother and sister according to the same totem, according to the same blood. They are no longer linked like that. People are now linked according to these new churches. They are the new families. And, and it is causing a lot of rapture. All that can be summarized by the word ideology. When you want to advance a certain ideas. You want to surround whatever idea you have with the things that make people believe. And these can be symbols. The eggs you're talking about are just the symbols. The tree you're talking about, those are symbols. You know. And the purpose of symbols, uh, the purpose of any symbol is actually to solidify an idea. So each time you see the symbol, the idea comes back. It's like the cross. Remember, the other time I once said, when somebody asked me something similar, they said, there's a mbuyane under tree. 
and that the Buyane and the tree was struck whether by lightning or by wind, it has fallen. And there are people who were making all sorts of bizarre interpretations of the falling of that tree. And I remember correcting those misconceptions by saying that if it is true that Mbeyane and I was hung on that particular tree, then why would we celebrate a tree where our ancestor was killed? Here is a knife. It was used to cut your father's throat. And you keep the knife as a token of appreciation. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm saying these things because I want you to understand the significance of symbolism. So symbols are used in order to solidify a concept. And you need to be very careful about how symbols are interpreted. So the, the, the prism with which we interpret symbolism is what I referred to earlier as ideology. What is the ideological formation that you are using to interpret this particular symbol? So, and then the other, the other reason why we are using these symbols is uh, uh, to, 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 to make uh, even illusion look like it's a reality. Power of symbolism. So, but the question and the point I want to emphasize is that you need to interrogate what is the ideological positionality that is being used to interrogate or interpret a symbol. The Catholics with their cross, I mean, from an Africa centered perspective, walking around with the cross where your boss was killed would be blasphemous. I mean, this is, it, I love Jesus so well. And I see a cross, it must make me angry. But you see them, uh, subversion. It's called a game of psychological subversion. Upside down.